Hello friends, hola amigos. Today I'm going to speak about Easy Car Electrics. Welcome to a new video. So guys, over the last few years I did a lot of modifications to the car. Uh, sometimes people tell me that they're enthusiastic about the new option but they don't dare to do it for themselves uh, because it includes sometimes soldering or wire connections as well and that's a pity because it doesn't have to be that difficult at all so in this video i will therefore show you the simple basics in order to make you understand better how things work and make you feel safe to perform the changes yourself so to begin you should understand that the car works with direct current this is different from the 230 volts or 110 if you live overseas in your house. It's the reason that your car doesn't have plugs like this, but it has plugs like this. A simple drawing will explain it better. So in your house, the current uh, is alternating over the two power wires, hence the name, alternating current. If a ground wire is added, it's for security reasons only, to avoid any current leaks flowing through your body. In the car, however, the current is always sent over the very same wire. The plus circuit. And the circuit is completed by the ground wire that goes all the way back. You therefore need a connector where the positive side always makes contact with the positive wire and vice versa. That's why these come in so handy that you don't have to remember in what direction you have to plug them in. As the car is one big metallic object and therefore a good conductor, the ground connection is also connected to the car. This means that you can feed an electric user with a plus wire and you can complete the circuit easily by attaching the ground wire to a nearby metallic object in the car. As the car works with 12 volts, only some trucks they have 24 volts, it's also safe to touch the wires while being connected. The 12 volt won't harm you as would the powerful 230 volts indoors would do. The main principle of electricity remain however, so do not make the plus and negative wire touch each other or you will have a short circuit. Insulate your connection in order to avoid any unwanted contact, avoid water contact and work safe. Be aware of any inflammable materials, objects and so on. So with these very basics, we come to the main problem and that is when you want to connect an accessory to the car. So the car has one main power source, the car battery. However, from there, many different connections are made to different par car parts. When tapping into one of them, you first want to be sure that there's no interference with critical parts as steering, braking, fuel, etc. You rather would use power sources for interior lighting, the tow hook, or even spare connections. Your best option here is the fuse box. Most commonly, this one is be found near the dashboard. You can find there a lot of different fuses for all kinds of uses. In the Qashqai, the use of each fuse is nicely indicated in the fuse box panel. In better YouTube tutorials, the, the best fuse to use is clearly indicated. You could also get a lot of useful information on a fan club forum which exists for almost every specific car brand. So one of the advantages when working with a specific fuse is that you can cut the power for that circuit that you're working on by simply removing the fuse. And if things go wrong, only that fuse would be likely to blow and you know what part is impacted and you can easily restore it by replacing a new fuse. And believe me, we have all been there. The car uses two kinds of connections, permanent and switched connections. 
The first one is always on, even when the motor doesn't run. This option is ideal for accessories that should always work, as the car horn or the indicator lights for instance, and so on. The second one does only work when the car is switched on. Most commonly, this is when you unlock the car and it will remain live for a given amount of time or remain live when you start the motor. This kind of connection is ideal for options who aren't critical. Main advantage is that they spare your car's battery life. The dash cam would be a good illustration of these connections. If you wire your dash cam to a switched wire, it will go on when you unlock the car and it will go off when you lock the car, often several seconds afterwards. However, when you wire your dash cam to a permanent wire, it will always be on, very nice to record all the time, but it will also use power from the battery all the time. So make sure you choose upfront what kind of connection you need and search for a suited one. With the car off, you can easily test with a multimeter which fuses are still live and which are not. Now we know where to take the power from, you need to define how you are going to take it. It is always wise to add an additional fuse to your accessory if it isn't already the case. The fuse rating is marked in the fuse, so that's no rocket science here. To tap into another circuit, there are multiple solutions. You could start from the fuse or use the connection further on, on the wires itself. To connect to the existing wires, make sure you use the correct wires. For instance, for my additional 12 volt source in the trunk, I wire to the cigarette lighter in the armrest. I know this one is switched, I know uh, the fuse location and rating, and I know I have to use the blue and black wires coming from the cigarette lighter, where the blue one is the positive wire. Connecting directly to the wires is very easy. You could solder, but that would require some training and experience, especially when having to do directly in the car itself on places with little accessibility. Soldered connection would provide the best quality and lifespan. I use it especially on connections that I can make up front on my working table with enough time and space. When doing it directly on the car, I use these solder shrink tubes, which provide a great alternative. In this video, I show you how they work. So you twist the wires, very easy. You slide it just over to the bit you want to solder, as this. And you need some kind of heat source, so I will use my um, Heating gun. Like this. Eventually, the lead will melt. So as you can see now, this was isolated and soldered in the same time. Really neat. Soldering often needs the original wire to be cut. Maybe you want to avoid this. That is when I use scotch lock connectors. There are various versions available. These ones are put around the main cable and you can put the additional cable in as well. When pinched the metallic part slices through both cables and makes a contact. I personally prefer these models over these because these make a better connection. Here again, we put the connector around the cable with the metallic part.
the pin sim. And on the other cable, you put this male connector. And then you could easily plug them in like this. And you can remove them and swap them if needed. For example, if you are not too sure which cable is the plus and which is the ground. The great advantage of these connectors is that you can easily remove them as well and with a little tape over them the sliced part um, of the cable is as new. Those connectors aren't waterproof though, so take that in mind when working on an exposed part. For that, I use my 3M waterproof connectors. You just, you don't even have to strip the wire, you just put them inside, use a pair of pliers to uh, push the connector down and they are sealed with silicon, so they are completely waterproof. This only will fit thinner cables though. For simple connections that aren't that important, you could also dry twist and insulate. This is by far the easiest way, but of course it won't guarantee a connection as solid. I use it mainly for non-vital accessories and parts that ain't exposed to any friction or movement. You could also use current directly from the fuse itself by using a piggyback or add a circuit connector. As the name states, you can simply add an extra fuse to it and put it in the same fuse holder. The original part will still have its own fuse and you simply add a new one on top. In this video I show you how to correctly place a piggyback in order to make it work properly. So when using this kind of um, add a circuit or piggyback you should be aware um, that you have to plug it in the right way. So um, first of all you have to check with the multimeter where you put the multimeter on 20 volts of course so like this we put it on the negative terminal and then you should check in the fuse itself in the fuse holder which side of the fuse holder is the positive side. So in this case the positive side is the left side. So when you place the piggyback this extreme end, this side, has to be on the positive side. That, that way the current that way the current will come in from here, go through the fuse to the positive side. If you put it in the wrong way around the fuse doesn't work and the current have to zigzag around and your fuse won't blow, but both fuses will blow. So as you can see here, other important thing, the original fuse is 30 amps. Your add, added circuit has to be a lower amperage. So here I used a 10 amp. So that's how to correctly use a piggyback. When wiring an accessory and placing a fuse, you should use a proper rating. You do not want to use a rating too low 
and blow the fuse when not needed, but don't want it to be too high and expose the original fuse to unnecessary risks. You know the current of the car is 12 volts. You should look up in the product specifications how many watts is used by the accessory. So the formula is quite simple. Watt divided by volt is amp. So in the case of my cooling box that uses 90 watt, I divide it by 12 volt, which gives me seven and a half amp. So when I use a 10 amp fuse, I know it will be enough for the normal use, but low enough to blow when the cooling box is overheating, and it is still low enough to be tapped into the 15 amp fuse from our original power source. Of course, you should also take in consideration possible other devices plugged into that same power source. In my case, that is the dash cam, which only uses 2 amp maximum. So, with the 10 amp together, I'm far from the 15 amps that it could have. So, a last thing that you should keep in mind is the cable thickness that you're using. I love to work with these audio cables that you can find in your local do-it-yourself store and are available in different sizes. The most common are the 75 square millimeter, the one and a half square millimeter and the two and a half square millimeter. Sometimes the American wire gouge or AWG is used then these are the sizes. Personally, I like to use this side um, as a reference to calculate the correct cable's thickness. You want to use a cable thick enough to cope with the current you're sending through without using excessive thick, thick cables that is hard to work with. So, I hope you like this video and see you in the very next one. Bye bye!